All right. Well, I will go through my spiel while we let people come in here. here. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Kristen Biermeyer, and I'm the marketing manager for Wagner CPAs. Um, we're so glad that you could join us today for this QuickBooks users group. We're happy to um, have you all here virtually with us. The webinar is being recorded today. So um, that will be emailed to you after today's event for your reference. We will begin today's session with a brief presentation from James Conrad on getting ready for year end. And after that, the session is intended to be highly interactive and we'll have lots of time for questions and group discussion. So please feel free to submit all of your questions through the chat feature that's at the bottom of your screen. And we'll have time to go through those after James um, James's presentation. As I mentioned, our group leader today is James Conrad. He is a supervisor at Wagner CPAs. And we also have panelists, Tara Hall, a senior accountant, and Hava Cole Mitchell, a staff accountant at Wagner CPAs, joining us on the call. With that, James, I will turn things over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the return of the QuickBooks users group. Uh, we're excited to uh, uh, present to you today, get back out there and see what kind of uh, issues you may be facing, uh, something we can help you out with. And uh, today we wanted to go through a little program first. It's getting to be the end of the year, um, time to uh, make sure your books are in uh, good order. So I wanted to walk through a few things to look for as we're um, approaching the end of the year. So there's some pretty common pitfalls with um, QuickBooks that I've run into over the years that I've been using it with, um, with clients. So bank reconciliations. Number one, if the bank reconciliations aren't done, odds are you're going to have transactions that either shouldn't belong there, a duplicates, or something is entered incorrectly. Um, so that's going to be something we go through today. Accounts receivable. A very common trouble is if a payment was received for something that was placed into accounts receivable. However, it was just deposited instead of doing a receive payment on it. Um, and that will lead to incorrect balances in your accounts receivable. We have undeposited funds. It's everyone's favorite account. Uh, you may wonder, why is there a balance in there? We'll, uh, we'll talk about that today. Fixed assets. Do you have a building? Do you have property, land, vehicles? Um, are you running depreciation on it? Uh, we'll be talking about that. Much like accounts receivable, we'll be talking about accounts payable. If you write a checkout for something, instead of using the pay bills feature, you may be having duplicate bills and payments in your system. And then finally, accrued expenses. Um, end of the year comes along, you may have some days of payroll that you need to have on the books before the end of the year, even though they don't get paid, until the uh, beginning of the next year. So starting off with bank reconciliations. So when you go in and do your bank reconciliations, here's some of the things to look for. Are there stale checks that are old? Now imagine you paid a vendor six months, one year, two years ago, and they still haven't cashed the check. What are you going to do with those checks? Well, number one, the easiest thing to do is to contact them and ask, hey, why haven't you cashed the check yet? It'd be kind of surprising that they didn't also reach out to you wondering, hey, why haven't you paid us yet? But be that as it may, sometimes you'll get individuals that either lost the check, forgot about it. It happens a lot. Do you need to escheat it? Now, some of you may not be familiar with the escheatment process, but that is basically turning over amounts that are owed to the state as part of the unclaimed property system. So more often than not, you can contact the recipient, but worse comes to worse, um, the, there are some rules that need to be investigated for sending it to unclaimed property. And then finally, do you have some duplicate entries? Did you enter a check, check twice or maybe hit pay bills and then added a check as a write check? Um, keep, keep an eye out for um, payments that have the same dollar amount payments that have the same check number. QuickBooks will alert you for some of these things, but things do uh, slip through the cracks pretty frequently. 
Are there deposits that are not deposited? Again, uh, did you put in a deposit not using received payment? Did you just enter them as checks? Um, were collections marked as paid, but not? Did you say uh, vendor or customer XYZ sent in their check for $100, but it never went into the bank? Uh, keep an eye out for that. And then most, most, most importantly, does the reconciliation balance? If the difference is not zero, find the difference. You really do not want to have a balance in your reconciliation discrepancies account. It's so much better for the cleanliness of your books if you have a zero balance in that account. And as a best practice, do each account each month. Don't do the entire year at once. It's far too much information to go through um, an entire year's worth, especially in your operating checking account. You'll have hundreds, if not thousands of transactions in there. And if one is missing, how do you identify that? So for the companies that use the accrual basis, now, not every company out there, especially if you're only filing taxes, will be operating on the accrual basis. The two different base bases that we commonly use are accrual basis and cash basis. Cash basis means you recognize revenue and expenses at the time of collection or payment of the cash, whereas accrual basis follows when you owe the money or when you are owed the money, that's when revenue and expenses are uh, recognized. So if you're on the accrual basis and you have an accounts receivable, run the aging report. It's in the, it's one of the canned reports in the report section. Um, you'll see is should anything be written off? You may have a customer that you know is just not going to pay. If that's the case, um, could be written off to bad debt or the allowance for doubtful accounts. Um, was a payment received but didn't lower the customer's balance? Meaning, did something get entered in the make deposits window instead of using the received payments? Or did a customer prepay? If a customer has a negative balance, you may have a credit, excuse me, on their account. And that would be something that you may need to attach to a subsequent invoice. Just check to see if the balances make sense. And then our old friend, undeposited funds. So undeposited funds should only contain payments received, but not yet deposited at the end of the year. And if you're on a fiscal year, like June 30th, same thing. Um, most importantly here, do not just plug in a number as a journal entry to clear this account. Whenever you use the deposits window, you'll always have something that pops up to say, you should deposit this. Ooh, it it's just gets messy very quickly. Proper use of undeposited funds is imperative for clean books. As I mentioned before, there was fixed assets. So for your large purchases, your property, plant, and equipment, uh, was depreciation taken? Uh, some companies, if you're using the Section 179 depreciation, uh, you may not have any depreciation for some items in prior years. What you'll want to do is obviously ask your accountant or whoever is managing your fixed asset system uh, to see if the, um, anything needs to happen. Uh, was anything purchased or, excuse me, uh, or disposed of? Uh, And then much like accounts receivable, we have accounts payable. Um, most importantly with accounts payable, I've noticed is dates. Are there bills that you owed on 1231 that are on the books? Or is there anything that is on the books at 1231 that you don't owe yet? Is it a 2021 expense or is it a 2022 expense? Old bills. Did you pay them, but we use a write, the right check function? Didn't clear the bill out? Check to see if there's anything very old in your system. And then for accrued expenses, um, have you entered expenses that are owed to people or places, but have not yet been paid? Most common that I've seen is payroll. You will have, say, if your pay period ends on the 26th, but you don't get paid until a week later, you should have payroll for that pay period on the books 
in addition to the days following the 26th all the way up until the 31st. You owe that money to your employees. So that should be expenses in the current year, not next year. If you're on the accrual basis, cash basis again would be different. And then just some final roundup thoughts here. If you're looking at your profit and loss statement or for our nonprofit clients, uh, the statement of activities, uh, check to see if you have expenses in the wrong account. One of the things I frequently like to do is run uh, either of these reports by month. Take a look at your insurance, your rent, things that usually have the same balance each month. Do you see each month having the same amount at the same time? If not, maybe something got placed in the wrong bucket or uh, it wasn't paid at all. Much, much other things, uh, four for quarterly, insurance payments often are quarterly. Um, anything you know that's on a specific time frame, take a look for it. Uh, do you have anything in Ask Your Accountant or on Categorized Income or Expense? Um, so a lot of times people will put those if they just aren't sure where they should go. Now's the time to clean those up and figure out where they go. So that's it for the um, presentation portion of the um, user group today. Uh, Tara and Hava are going to be talking about uh, two of the common questions we receive from the uh, sign up section. So go ahead and take it away. Oh, Tara, you're muted. There we go. All right. So I'm going to start, <clears throat> excuse me and address the common question, is QuickBooks desktop going away? I know that's been asked for the last few years and we've seen some recent changes with the way QuickBooks 2022 desktop is changing. So it is moving to a subscription-based, uh, instead of actually just purchasing the whole program, it will be a monthly or yearly subscription base now but that does not mean that desktop is going anywhere. They put a lot of money still into their desktop and upgrading and the desktop does serve some more complex businesses. So it is not going anywhere. It is just changing. Um, some of the benefits of going to a subscription based, it's gonna have more up-to-date features and security available to you immediately. It's going to be faster, up to 38% faster and more reliable. Your data will be available to you as recovery, unlimited with unlimited customer support. And normally that used to be an extra fee. It's all included. Uh, also with QuickBooks Online, if you are interested in finding out more about what you can do with QuickBooks Online, options available to you, just help reach out to us at the QuickBooks Help Desk, QB Help Desk at wegnercpa.com. As a client of Wegner, we can offer some training on what's available, what might be a good option for you if you're thinking about switching. And we can also help you do the transaction into online from desktop and then do training as well. So those are some of the options available for you. Is there any questions? I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I'm a QuickBooks Pro advisor. So I pay one annual uh, fee to have multiple clients and all, and that, and I do yep. that on desktop and also for my it covers my online client. Do you know if this subscription change is going to alter that? or you might not know? Not specifically. Um, it's all on, online right now. You can look at the advisor. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can do that. I can do that. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about payroll on QuickBooks Online. Um, I had read that you cannot, I have a person, a person's paycheck cannot be deposited to two different bank accounts on QuickBooks Online. Do you know if that's true? 
James, are you familiar? Two different. Uh, I wasn't aware that it couldn't be. Yeah. Um, are they one savings and one checking, or are they both the same type of account? I don't know. I just had heard that you can't, um, you can't do two accounts. Or maybe I don't really understand which one, what they were talking about, that you can't split payroll, is that maybe you can't split it into, we use classes, um, and some of our employees work in two different classes, two different departments. Um, maybe that was the, there was something about splitting payroll. Um, I wonder if they were also talking about the pay periods. Um, if you have some operating on uh, the 24 schedule versus the 26 schedule. I don't know, I'll call, I guess I'll email you. Yeah, that would be just uh, screenshots. So if you're, um, if any of you are familiar with the snipping tool on Windows, go ahead and take a screenshot, paste it in the email and that really helps us out. Well, I'm on desktop now and we're trying to decide what to do whether to go to subscription because we're on 2019. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so you're we quickly have to make approaching the three-year mark where they'll, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's Intuit something. likes to say, this doesn't work anymore. Yeah, you can reach out to us and we can set up an appointment and go through your specific business and questions. Okay, thank you. And then Hava, do you want to uh, talk about 1099s at this point? Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to talk about 1099s, saw that was a common question that some people had. Um, so we would not recommend uh, you use QuickBooks services to process your 1099s. Um, we would sell our services, of course, and encourage you if you are a client of Wegner to have us help you with 1099s if you need help with those. Um, we have standard processing fees based on how many 1099s you need to have um, filed. And we do the e-filing with the state and federal. So we take care of everything for you. We do all that work. Um, so if you do need 1099 services from us, I would recommend contacting uh, whoever is your main contact at Wegner if you're our client. Um, and if you are not a client, I would recommend becoming a client. Um, additionally, um, people wanted to know a little bit about how to run 1099 reports. Um, so my recommendation to run 1099 reports to see what you need to do, um, see who qualifies for 1099 for you, is to look at your profit and loss for the year and look at the expenses and see, like if you have accounting services that you've used, if you have um, a contractor that you've used for something, if you've paid them over $600 in the year, then you need to issue them a 1099 if they are if they qualify if they're not like a corporation. Um, if you pay them with credit card, you do not need to issue them a 1099, um, which is great. So if you've paid like Wagner with a credit card, then you are all good to go, no 1099 needed. Um, so I would recommend looking at your data and seeing what is there. You can run a general ledger report or you can run profit and loss and then look through each account and see um, what you have in there. Uh, I, you can also try, I think that I believe there's 1099 reports for QuickBooks and QuickBooks desktop, desktop and online. Um, they don't always capture everything. Um, that's why I recommend going by account, just because you make sure you capture all the information that you want to have. Um, so that's the best, little basic on 1099s. Again, I would recommend that you uh, use us and we can help you to process those and file them on time because the penalties for 1099s not being filed is not fun. Um, so that's my little 1099 blurb. Yeah. I guess a question. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm still not clear. What is what is the issue with QuickBooks and using 1099s if you've done it in the past and haven't had any issues? Why? Uh, QuickBooks doesn't do all of the state filing for you. Um, so they only do federal, um, which is becoming a uh, thing for the next, I believe it's for next tax year. Um, their states are requiring them to be separate files. So it's going to be like more of a, a another step. Um, maybe QuickBooks is going to add that. I don't know um, at this point. But I mean, if you if you trust QuickBooks and you're good, then you only have a couple tiny nines. You know, you can. You certainly can. But um, my recommendation is to uh, have someone help you and just make sure everything's good. Um, I've seen penalties not be pretty. Uh, 
like really not good. So if you are confident in QuickBooks, then that I works, would caution but, any user yeah. if they have multiple states that they're paying their 1099 vendors. Yeah. Often you'll have remote workers in different states uh, and the rules are different for each state. So mm -hmm. um, that's at that point where I caution using Intuit's filing service. If you're yeah. just in Wisconsin and you only have a couple of 1099s and you're able to do the filing uh, to Wisconsin either via the mail if you're under a certain number of 1099s or a different method, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just why we would recommend that because it, if you, I think it's, it's only like 10 1099s if you get above a certain, it's a very small number um, that. I want to say it was 10 and for some reason six is also in my head, but. Yeah, it's a very it, small, a number. small so number. So if you have, yeah. So if you have a few workers that could add up quickly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jackie Montgomery uh, left a very good comment in the chat here. For 1099s, you should also look at leasehold improvements in the balance sheet if you paid a contractor for those items. That is a good point. Check your fixed assets, also your prepaid expenses. You'll occasionally have uh, items from your balance sheet or your statement of financial position that are not flagged by QuickBooks and are meant to be 1099 payments. They're just not grabbed by the system. Um, I've run into that personally a few times. So um, if you, when you review them and it just doesn't make sense, take a look at the actual vendor payments made over the course of the year. If it just doesn't add up, it may not be grabbing the right information. Okay, and then I did receive a question earlier um, about for our nonprofit um, companies out there um, from Pat Van Voorhees. Uh, first, we utilize class breakdown by facility or program. Yet for functional expense reporting, there's a lot of work that goes into pulling that report together. Is there a way to run QuickBooks reporting to handle class reporting as well as coding to functional expense? So I have dealt with this um, personally a few times. Um, I'm a nonprofit accountant by trade. I most frequently work with nonprofits and going through audits and trying to assemble a functional can be a real hassle. What I suggest is that you organize your classes into the three functional types. So you would have your admin in general, your fundraising, and then underneath a, a parent program class, your subclasses would be your individual programs. If you're able to do that, that would make your functional a lot easier to assemble. Unfortunately, there is no uh, statement of functional expense in QuickBooks that I'm aware of. It could be new and added. I just haven't personally come across it. Um, but at that point, if you organize your classes a certain way and you continue using classes um, the way I think you're using them, you should have an easier time doing it. Oh, no, here we go. Second part of that comment. Uh, we see a report statement of functional expense in QuickBooks. Does anyone else on a call utilize such a report? Um, assembling it with the classes is probably the best way to go. I've also noticed um, some of the QuickBooks reports that are more uh, trying to be more advanced have a little more trouble. Uh, statement of cash flows isn't the greatest that comes out of QuickBooks. Um, using your class or arranging your classes and then running these uh, statement of activities by class is my preferred method of doing it. Anybody have um, an audio question that they'd like to offer? I'd like to ask Tara a question on the uh, QuickBooks Online. We are a de current desktop, QuickBooks desktop user and are exploring moving to the online version. Um, there's several reasons why we're looking at it, but I'm not necessarily 100% sold that that's a necessity either. 
what are some pitfalls that you've seen um, as far as when companies have chosen to migrate or some issues that they've had or, or, or wins, I guess, that they've had? Um, for the transfer itself, is that what you're asking, trying to get the information over? Well, I mean, I'm quite frankly used to much bigger accounting systems where, you know, upgrades and migrations are year long projects and incredibly complicated. So I'm a little bit leery that, you know, it's as smooth as everyone advertises. So I guess I just want to see in your experience, have you seen the same thing where it's, you know, it, it it's seamless and integrated and it's 24 hours later, you're online and you just keep, keep moving that seems a little bit too good to be true. And I'm, I'm, I've been postponing making this transition for a long time because I'm just trying to get some feedback on the realities of the, the transition. Yeah, I mean, it's never gonna be 100% perfect all the time. There's a lot of factors involved. Uh, a lot of it is how big your current company file is how old it is and if the updates have been done but that we um since we've been doing it quite a bit here at Wagner we know a lot of workarounds to your specific issues we'll look at when we have initial meetings we'll ask you a lot of questions and we'll see what specific issues you might have bringing items over and how much you actually want to bring over as well so there's a lot of pre-planning questions ahead of time to help avoid big pitfalls during the actual transfer. My lab, a slight counterpoint, but at the same time, um, ag agreeing with Tara, my last QuickBooks desktop to QuickBooks online transition took an hour and it was complete from start to finish. It can be very quick, but a lot of it depends on how clean the original set of books in desktop is. If it's clean, uh, usually it's just a couple of, um, debris transactions, I like to call them, something that just kind of pops up from history that you didn't even know it existed. And then we just are able to clean those up. Um, what I have noticed is if you're in a very old version of QuickBooks, like anything prior to 16 at this point, um, upgrading it to current uh, systems like 21, and then doing the conversion is going to work a lot better. Okay. Okay, thank you. I've got a question. Um, and that is we're looking to upgrade from uh, desktop version 2012 <clears throat> to something current. So what are the steps that are necessary? I wanna stay in desktop version. I'm not looking to go um, <clears throat> to an internet-based version. And how much time does it take in the transition steps? We've just gone through a database change at work. And so the people don't have a lot of um, tolerance for another big change. So I want to be realistic. Yep. Terry, do you want to field that one? Sure. Um, Moving from desktop to a newer version of desktop is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, James, I don't know if going like a two step into it a little bit newer, just cause the usually, what is it? The range is like six years, five, six years between the jumps for a smooth, like I would into even a argue new... less than that. I would probably I say around three is the easiest. Yeah. yeah. You three can jump yeah. What, uh, mm -hmm. a wider range, but mm -hmm the way the data is organized tends to be different in the later versions. Yeah. Yeah, three is the easiest. So like you do like 2012 to 2015, 15 okay. to 18, 18 to 21, something like that. Yeah. One thing um, that was brought up to me is that the interface for desktop versus online is very different. A lot of the names are the same, but things are organized very differently. You don't have the top banner like you would with the drop, you know, file, edit, and then the rest of them. Uh, things are organized more as modules than drop down menus. It is a big change at first, but once you get in there, 
I've noted, like I prefer online over desktop now. So once you get in there and using it, it's become second nature. And I, there's a lot of benefits to online too. I like to call myself the QuickBooks online evangelist because I will always sing the praise of online over desktop. And that was not common uh, <laughs> even just a couple of years ago. Um, the biggest thing about online that I appreciate the most is the bank feeds function where you are doing far less hard key entry of your transactions and you're able to um, you're able to get data directly from the bank and code it from a set that they download each day. Um, that is something that I've been exploring to have another uh, webinar about in the future. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That'll probably be in a later version of the user group when we do a specific QB online. Just trying to catch up here on the um, the chat here. See if uh, if I haven't answered your question yet. I think I uh, grabbed everybody, but <clears throat> if I didn't uh, message or if I didn't uh, respond to you yet, yet, just let me know. So Laura just posted a question. The uh, you could do bank feeds on desktop. How is online different? Um, from my experience, unless you are working with specific banks, you have to download the activity manually. There are a few banks that do allow you to have automated bank feeds, but I believe you have to pay a fee for most of those. For online, it works with virtually every bank. I'm not going to say every bank, it's virtually every bank. And it'll download in the background at night and you'll have them ready for you in the morning. You can refresh them anytime you want. You don't actually have to download a file from the bank and then import it into QuickBooks. It is seamless and works automatically. And then using that, you can set up specific rules if you know a certain vendor is going to be the same expense each time. So for example, if you're using uh, Spectrum for your internet service, you can set up a rule that says Spectrum will always go to internet or telephone expense, uh, items like that. And it does speed up the process significantly. Great questions, everybody. Does anyone have specific questions for the end of the year if you're having any issues with um, something that's stuck in bank reconciliations or um, we, we were talking about the paycheck one before? One of the questions here is, um, it was answered a little later in the chat, chat but I do wanna bring it up. Um, is there special pricing for nonprofits? Yes, and it is significantly discounted from the uh, posted rated into it. If any of you are familiar, there's a website called TechSoup. TechSoup is, um, receives donations from various company, tech companies um, across the nation. Microsoft is involved into it for QuickBooks is involved, um, several other companies. You can get software and hardware at a steep discount if you are organized as a 501c3. It does not work for any of the other Cs. It only works for C3. But if you go through the verification process that they have when you open an account, usually it takes a couple of days for them to verify that you're eligible. Once you're eligible, you can purchase. You can purchase um, a, I believe it is a five license QuickBooks Online Plus um, subscription for one year for $75. $75 per year, not month. Whereas I believe Plus is now pushing $50 a month without any discounts involved. So it, it is substantial. And if you're also, um, on advanced, uh, you can get, I believe it's 25 licenses for a year for $150 per year. So 
just massive discounts. I can't sing their praises enough. Um, the caveat is you cannot already be in QuickBooks Online. You have to have a new email to sign up for an Intuit account. And from there, uh, you set up your QuickBooks. It is a specific process and I have lost licenses if when I did not follow the process. So if and when it comes to that point um, and you're a client of ours, reach out. We'll definitely be happy to help you out with that. Just scrolling on down. One of the questions here, especially for Tara, you, uh, you've been following this. Um, how does pricing compare for QBO versus 2022 Desktop Pro? And I guess the, the additional question I'd have with that is if you're a nonprofit, you can also go with the um, TechSoup subscription. But if you're a for-profit or a different type of nonprofit that isn't a C3, um, then there would be the different pricing. There we go. So, yeah, I'm just trying to do the math because they give us one in a year and one right. in a month. So, <laughs> so it's um, the desktop actually comes in a, if you're looking at essentials for QuickBooks Online, which is a little bit more. And then there's so essentials is about six hundred dollars a year. The simple start, which is the beginner for QuickBooks Online, that's about 300 a year. And then when looking at the 2022 desktop, for your basic desktop, it is for desktop pro, it's about 350 a year. So there is some pricing differences between the two. I would not suggest anybody using the simple start tier of right. QuickBooks Online. It's very stripped down. Um, my preferred tier is plus especially for nonprofits, because you do get the class function. Um, I believe the step below that is essentials and it does not have classes, but it does have accounts payable and receivable, whereas Simple Start does not. You basically have to operate on the cash basis with Simple Start. Uh, good question here from Cindy. I have a payment that does not appear, appear anywhere but payments to deposit. I can't get it to go away. There's a duplicate payment that was deleted, but it appears in the payments to deposit window. That sounds like one of those phantom transactions that just kind of pop up out of nowhere, huh? Um, I'm gonna have a little, going to need a little additional background on that one. Uh, do you have, uh, so does it appear in the deposits window uh, when you yeah. try and make a deposit as if it's in undeposited funds? Or, yes. oh, yes. I'm sorry, what was that? Sorry, we helped I put the microphone down. Uh -huh. um, I was getting ready for a conference and there I put in a duplicate payment, uh -huh. realized it deleted the payment, but it was still showing up in the payment, Matthew. Every time I go to do a deposit, that payment is at the top, but there's mm -hmm. nowhere else where it's listed and I can't figure out how to make it go away. Okay. And when so Adam does an audit on my thing, it's gonna make him crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, when you initially entered the payment, was it an invoice or did yes. you do it as a cat? It was an invoice. Yes. So you deleted the invoice, I'm assuming. Yes. Did you delete the receive payment on it? Yes. Okay. It might. And you should know that this was a thing done in November and my books reconciled perfectly. Mm -hmm. But I can't make this puppy go away. So so for something to appear in the deposit window, it has to be in undeposited funds. I, That's basically the flag that QuickBooks looks for, for things to pop up in that depo make deposits window. Okay. So was there a journal entry made to undeposited funds? No, not yet. Mm, oh, not yet at all. Oh, we don't want it at all. Um, uh, journal entry to undeposit funds is only going to make another thing pop up into that window, even if they cancel out. And if your bank reconciliation is correct, that's where I'm, I think this is going to be one of those things I'd have to see. My gut says um, that there is a received payment somewhere that isn't being found. 
like there was a second payment received on the delete on the invoice. And it's just um, try looking at the accounts receivable aging in your books and see if there's something that pops up for that customer. If that's the case, I think you do have a duplicate entry. Okay, accounts receivable aging. Correct. The aging, you can use the detail or summary. I like the summary because it's a quicker read. It's a little easier to read. All right, and any other kind of troubleshooting questions? I love fielding these because it makes me think about the workflows that are involved with QuickBooks. Um, similar to this, like I mentioned in the presentation, uh, if you have any bills that aren't going away, um, it says you made a payment, but there's no associated bill with it, check to see if there was anything deleted. Um, often because of the multiple steps that need to take place to uh, pay a bill or clear an invoice, um, if one of those things gets deleted, you'll have debris transactions either with an extra check that shouldn't be there or um, the uh, just an expense that isn't showing up. You'll have negative balances in uh, AP and AR. Um, just some funny things will happen if you don't delete everything involved. A uh, question from Elizabeth here. We are in the process of updating our primary merchant account contact. We're having some trouble with that. Are you changing um, merchant processors to your credit card processor? A little additional no. info on that. Oh, go ahead. So basically, so we have so we have QuickBooks Online and we have, you know, the primary admin, but also we realize that the primary admin is different from the merchant account admin. Mm, okay. um, and so we, but so we need to update the merchant account admin. But, I mean, they're still here, but they're just not the best person to do that specific thing. And so okay. we want to update that, but we're having a hard time getting an answer from them on how exactly to do that. And we can't do it online. Okay. So just making sure I understand correctly, you want to have the merchant user and the primary admin user to be the same? Uh, perhaps, or at least like change the merchant admin. Okay. Unfortunately, I think the only way to do that is through the merchant. I don't think there is necessarily anything through QuickBooks unless you're using QuickBooks payments. Which we are. Okay, if that's the case. Um, hmm. So your credit card processing is going through QuickBooks payments. Just make sure I understand. So we do multiple, we have multiple processors, but mm, we do okay. some payments through QuickBooks. Um, and like, basically there's like a, there's a, an, a transaction that we're trying to get information about. And they're like, okay, we'll only talk about this transaction, um, like a deposit or a fee that they, that they charged us um, with the primary merchant admin specifically, not the, not the QuickBooks primary admin, but the merchant account admin. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hmm. That's an interesting case. I'm thinking, hmm. Have you noticed any conflicts with the multiple processors? Um, no, no. Okay. I haven't run into that personally. That would be, that's a new one for me. So. I've, I've not had it where I've had companies that have used Square, Stripe, QuickBooks payments. They've used all of them at the same time, and there hasn't been a conflict. I think the issue here is keeping all of those, discussing the right ones with the right processor. Um, I'm not sure if we're asking the same question. Okay. <laughs> but basically, yeah. like, 
Yeah, so definitely there isn't an issue other than that QuickBooks charge us a, a small fee and I can't seem to find it. Basically, it's like one of those ghost things where I think that a certain transaction failed, but they never told us. And so I'm trying to get information about that, but that, that they will only tell that to the merchant account admin who is different from the primary QuickBooks admin. So I'm trying to figure out how to change the merchant account admin, um, which is where okay. I'm running. Into I see. Quickbooks. All right. Yeah. Um, in this mm -hmm. case, I think I'd have to see it. So send it, uh, are you um, a client of Wagner's? Uh, sort of, yes. <laughs> yeah. I if know. you are, um, go ahead and send the um, uh, a ticket over to the QB help desk. And that'd be something that we could take a look at. All right, well, it, that's one of those where I, I can't diagnose it necessarily without seeing it. Oh, okay. Good uh, question here from Ashley. Can you elaborate on what exactly journal entries are and what, when the functions should be used? So often you'll see, um, especially when you have audit adjustments or adjustments from your tax preparer, you'll have entries that are made to change balances of your accounts that are outside the normal ways you may be doing things. If you only do um, the payable side, you don't necessarily deal with the receivable side and vice versa. Or there's something that doesn't really fit in any of the regular functions. For example, depreciation. Depreciation isn't something that you run through a, as a write check or as an invoice. General, general journal entries are for those other things. It's for things like depreciation, um, let's see, what else would it be? Um, Havatera, feel free to chime in if I'm missing any. You pay expenses, you yep. have some insurance, you want to expense part of the insurance. Um, payroll. Like payroll, payroll, how did I forget mm -hmm. payroll? Making sure you're, if you're not entering payroll at the time of payment and you're using a clearing account, that would be a perfect use of it. So, if you're, um, it's basically for those things that don't fit anywhere else. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any troubleshoots? Got those stuck payments? Got those? Um, not quite sure where you should do put something. Um, so a little bit of what's going to be going on in the future. Um, since this is the return of, the, of uh, the user group, we're planning on holding them quarterly going forward. And we're going to be alternating between the two different softwares, desktop and online. So we can do a little bit more focus on the particular softwares. So if you were, uh, today was more of a reintroduction to just an overall look um, again, we'll be soliciting questions ahead of time um, and feel free to get very specific with what you're dealing with, um, especially because um, we can look things up ahead of time. We can investigate your problem or even ask you, reach out to you if you have a specific issue. Um, it may be something that we can demonstrate to everybody, um, maybe more common than you think. So um, be on the lookout. Kristen will be sending out information about that as time goes on. Um, Kristen, do you remember the, the date of the next uh, next user group? Let me. I want to say this it was March. March. Or March. Um, okay. And I believe it was the thirty first. Let me double check. Yep, March thirty first is the next one, and then June twenty third is the one after that. Okay. The one in March, um, especially if you're a nonprofit. Well, actually, anybody for that matter. Um, Tax, tax time is coming up right around that time. And if um, it's it's really close to the 15th of April there and then May 15th for the nonprofits. Um, so tax questions, definitely a good idea. Um, if, you've if you've finished your taxes, but you've received entries uh, from your preparer, Especially, I know um, the tax preparers here at Wagner will supply a list of the changes that they made to get to your taxes. Um, if you have questions about that, bring them at that point. 
Um, happy to help. That's one of the most common questions we get at the help desk is um, how do we make these entries and make our books reflect what our taxes showed. Oh, uh, good question, Sandy. Um, is the March date for online or desktop? I'm, I want to say it was going to be desktop. So James, I had in my notes, I just made a note that to follow up with you after this meeting. So sorry to do this to you live, but no, um, I had that we were going to separate between nonprofits and businesses. Um, so you'll have to let me know if that's okay. not the case. We will clarify that going forward. So um, that's definitely, uh, yeah, I want to get that clarified beforehand. So, um, so yeah, thank you, Sandy, for asking that. Um, you will see the information when we send that out um, when as the time approaches. Yeah, um, definitely. And hopefully everybody on this call is already on our email list. Um, that's where you'll get the news first. We will we'll be regularly communicating these sessions um, out via that list. So if you're not getting emails from me, please reach out so that I can get you signed up. Um, there's also a subscription form right on our, our website. So either email me or, or jump on over to our website at wagnercpas.com to make sure you're on that list. Also on the website, um, we have a, a lot of resources. Um, one of the things is the blog. I wrote the blog entry that'll be upcoming from our um, accounting solutions group in January. I go a little more in depth with the year end process. So if you have any more questions about that, give that a read when it pops up early in the coming month. And then a note here from Susan, as a cooperative, I'm not sure whether I would come to the nonprofits or um, for-profit business. Yeah, that can be a bit of a challenge because cooperatives have their, their fun little quirks that they have to deal with accounting wise. So yeah, I understand that. Honestly, you would take aspects from both. I think, um, Boy, going to both isn't uh, the worst idea. All right, we are quickly approaching the two o'clock hour. So we'll call this last call for questions. If anybody has anything, um, as mentioned before, we have our, uh, if you are a client, we do have our email that feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll, uh, be happy to help or talk if you are a current client, reach out to your contact that you've been talking with at Wegner and they can direct you to us as well. So with that, if I don't have any additional questions, appreciate having you all here today. And Kristen has a couple of final words. Yeah, thank you, James, Hava and Tara for all of your expertise and sharing today. Um, some definitely some great information. Um, as we get started with these user groups again, I'm super interested in hearing any feedback that you have, um, things that you'd like to see, things, uh, ways we could change it to make it um, most beneficial for you. Um, we definitely want to um, take all of that into consideration. So again, feel free to reach out to me with any comments or suggestions. I'd love to hear it. And um, keep an eye out for some more information on our upcoming sessions. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you for joining Thanks for us. Thanks for coming, everyone.